War and Peace, Book 9, Chapter 9, read for LibriVox.org, by Martin Seeloff. Prince Andrew reached the general headquarters of the army at the end of June. The first army, with which was the emperor, occupied the fortified camp at Drissa. The second army was retreating, trying to effect a junction with the first one from which it was said to be cut off by large French forces. Everyone was dissatisfied with the general course of affairs in the Russian army, but no one anticipated any danger of invasion of the Russian provinces. And no one thought the war would extend farther than the western, the Polish provinces. Prince Andrew found Barclay de Tolly, to whom he had been assigned on the bank of the Drissa. As there was not a single town or large village in the vicinity of the camp, the immense number of generals and courtiers accompanying the army were living in the best houses of the villages on both sides of the river, over a radius of six miles. Barclay de Tully was quartered nearly three miles from the emperor. He received Bolkonsky stiffly and coldly, and told him in his foreign accent that he would mention him to the emperor for a decision as to his employment, but asked him meanwhile to remain on his staff. Anatoly Kuryagin, whom Prince Andrew had hoped to find with the army, was not there. He had gone to Petersburg, but Prince Andrew was glad to hear this. His mind was occupied by the interests of the center that was conducting a gigantic war, and he was glad to be free for a while from the distraction caused by the thought of Kuryagin. During the first four days, while no duties were required of him, Prince Andrew rode round the whole fortified camp, and by the aid of his own knowledge, and by talks with experts, tried to form a definite opinion about it. But the question whether the camp was advantageous or disadvantageous remained for him undecided. Already from his military experience, and what he had seen in the Austrian campaign, he had come to the conclusion that in war the most deeply considered plans have no significance, and that all depends on the way unexpected movements of the enemy that cannot be foreseen are met and on how and by whom the whole matter is handled. To clear up this last point for himself, Prince Andrew, utilizing his position and acquaintances, tried to fathom the character of the control of the army and of the men and parties engaged in it, and he deduced for himself the following of the state of affairs. While the emperor had still been at Vilna, the forces had been divided into three armies, first the army under Barclay de Tully, secondly the army under Bagration, and thirdly the one commanded by Tormasov. The emperor was with the first army, but not as a commander-in-chief. In the orders issued it was stated, not that the emperor would take command, but only that he would be with the army. The emperor, moreover, had with him not a commander-in-chief's staff, but the imperial headquarters staff. In attendance on him was the head of the imperial staff, Quartermaster General Prince Volkonsky, as well as generals, imperial aides de camp, diplomatic officials, and a large number of foreigners, but not the army staff. Besides these, there were in attendance on the emperor without any definite appointments Arakcheyev, the ex minister of war, Count Benigsen, the senior general in rank, the Grand Duke Tsarevich Konstantin Pavlovich, Count Rumyantsev, the chancellor, Stein, a former Prussian minister, Armfeld, a Swedish general, Fuel, the chief author of the plan of the campaign, Pellucci, an ad adjutant general and Sardinian emigre, Wolzigen, and many others. Though these men had no military appointment in the army, their positions gave them influence, and often a corps commander, or even the commander-in-chief, did not know in what capacity he was questioned by Benixen, the Grand Duke Arekchev, or Prince Volkonsky, or was given this or that advice and did not know whether a certain order received in the form of advice emanated from the man who gave it, or from the emperor, and whether it had to be executed or not. But this was only the external condition. The essential significance of the presence of the emperor and all of these people, from a courtier's point of view, and in an emperor's vicinity all became courtiers, was clear to everyone. It was this. The emperor did not assume the title of commander-in-chief, but disposed of all the armies, the men around him, were his assistants. Arakcheyev was a faithful custodian to enforce order and acted as the sovereign's bodyguard. 
Phoenixen was a landlord in the Vilna province who appeared to be doing the honors of the district, but was in reality a good general, useful as an advisor and ready at hand to replace Barclay. The Grand Duke was there because it suited him to be. The ex-minister Stein was there because his advice was useful, and the Emperor Alexander held him in high esteem personally. Armfelt virulently hated Napoleon and was a general full of self-confidence, a quality that always influenced Alexander. Bellucci was there because he was bold and decided in speech. The adjutants general were there because they always accompanied the emperor. And lastly and chiefly, Fuel was there because he had drawn up the plan of campaign against Napoleon and, having induced Alexander to believe in the efficacy of that plan, was directing the whole business of the war. With Fool was Wolzigen, who expressed Fool's thoughts in a more comprehensible way than Fuel himself, who was a harsh, bookish theorist, self-confident to the point of despising everyone else, was able to do. Besides these Russians and foreigners who propounded new and unexpected ideas every day, especially the foreigners, who did so with a boldness characteristic of people employed in a country not their own, there were many secondary personages accompanying the army because their principles were there. Among the opinions and voices in this immense, restless, brilliant, and proud sphere, Prince Andrew noticed the following sharply defined subdivisions of and parties. The first party consisted of fuel and his adherents, military theorists who believed in a science of war with immutable laws, laws of oblique movements, outflankings, and so forth. Fuel and his adherents demanded a retirement into the depths of the country in accordance with precise laws defined by a pseudo-theory of war, and they saw only barbarism, ignorance, or evil intention in every deviation from that theory. To this party belonged the foreign nobles, Wolzigen, Winston Gerod, and others, chiefly Germans. The second party was directly opposed to the first. One extreme, as always happens, was met by representatives of the other. The members of this party were those who had demanded an advance from Vilna into Poland and freedom from all prearranged plans. Besides being advocates of bold action, this section also represented nationalism, which made them still more one-sided in the dispute. They were Russians, Bagration, Yermolov, who was beginning to come to the front, and others. At that time, a famous joke of Yermolov's was being circulated, that, as a great favor, he had petitioned the emperor to make him a German. The men of that party, remembering Suvorov, said that what one had to do was not to reason, or stick pins into maps, but to fight, beat the enemy, keep him out of Russia, and not let the army get discouraged. To the third party, in which the emperor had most confidence, belonged the courtiers who tried to arrange compromises between the other two. The members of this party, chiefly civilians and to whom Arakcheyev belonged, thought and said what men who have no convictions but wish to seem to have some generally say. They said that undoubtedly war, particularly against such a genius as Bonaparte, they called him Bonaparte now, needs most deeply devised plans and profound scientific knowledge, and in that respect, fuel was a genius. But at the same time, it had to be acknowledged that the theorists are often one-sided and therefore one should not trust them absolutely, but should also listen to what Fuel's opponents and practical men of experience in warfare had to say, and then choose a middle course. They insisted on the retention of the camp at Drisa, according to Fuel's plan, but on changing the movements of the other armies, though by this course neither one aim nor the other could be obtained yet it seemed best to the adherents of this third party. Of a fourth opinion, the most conspicuous representative was the Tsarevich, who could not forget his disillusionment at Austerlitz, where he had ridden out at the head of the guards, in his cask and cavalry uniform, as to a review, expecting to crush the French gallantly, 
but unexpectedly finding himself in the front line had narrowly escaped amidst the general confusion the men of this party had both the quality and the defect of frankness in their opinions they feared napoleon recognized his strength and their own weakness and frankly said so they said nothing but sorrow shame and ruin will come of all this we have abandoned vilna and vitebsk and shall abandon drisa the only reasonable thing left to do is to conclude peace as soon as possible before we are turned out of petersburg this view was very general in the upper army circles and found support also in petersburg and from the chancellor rumiantsev who for other reasons of state was in favor of peace the fifth party consisted of those who were adherents of barclay de tully not so much as a man but as a minister of war and commander-in-chief be he what he may they always began like that he is an honest practical man and we have nobody better give him real power for war cannot be conducted successfully without unity of command and he will show what he can do as he did in finland if our army is well organized and strong and has withdrawn to drisa without suffering any defeats we owe this entirely to barclay if barclay is now to be superseded by benixen all will be lost for benixen showed his incapacity already in eighteen o seven the sixth party the benixenites said on the contrary that at any rate there was no one more active and experienced than benixen and twist about as you may you will have to come to benixen eventually let the others make mistakes now said they arguing that our retirement to drisa was a most shameful reverse and an unbroken series of blunders the more mistakes that are made the better it will at any rate be understood all the sooner that things cannot go on like this what is wanted is not some barclay or other but a man like benixen who made his mark in eighteen o seven and to whom napoleon himself did justice a man whose authority would be willingly recognized, and Benixen is the only such man. The seventh party consisted of the sort of people who are always to be found, especially around young sovereigns, and of whom there were particularly many round Alexander, generals and imperial aides de camp passionately devoted to the emperor, not merely as a monarch but as a man, adoring him sincerely and disinterestedly, as Rostov had done in 1805, and who saw in him not only all the virtues but all human capabilities as well these men though enchanted with the sovereign for refusing the command of the army yet blamed him for such excessive modesty and only desired and insisted that their adored sovereign should abandon his diffidence and openly announce that he would place himself at the head of the army gather round him a commander-in-chief staff and consulting experienced theoreticians and practical men were necessary would himself lead the troops, whose spirits would thereby be raised to the highest pitch. The eighth and largest group, which in its enormous numbers was to the others as ninety-nine to one, consisted of men who desired neither peace nor war, neither an advance nor a defensive camp at the Drisa or anywhere else, neither Barclay nor the Emperor nor Pfuel nor Benixen, but only the one most essential thing, as much advantage and pleasure for themselves as possible. In the troubled waters of conflicting and intersecting intrigues that eddied about the emperor's headquarters, it was possible to succeed in many ways unthinkable at other times. A man who simply wished to retain his lucrative post would today agree with fuel, tomorrow with his opponent, and the day after, merely to avoid responsibility or to please the emperor, would declare that he had no opinion at all on the matter. Another who wished to gain some advantage would attract the emperor's attention by loudly advocating the very thing the emperor had hinted at the day before, and would dispute and shout at the council, beating his breast and challenging those who did not agree with him to duels, thereby proving that he was prepared to sacrifice himself for the common good. A third, in the absence of his opponents, between two councils, would simply solicit a special gratuity for his faithful services well knowing that at the moment people would be too busy to refuse him. A fourth, while seemingly overwhelmed with work, would often come accidentally under the emperor's eye. A fifth, 
to achieve his long-cherished aim of dining with the emperor, would stubbornly insist on the correctness or falsity of some newly emerging opinion, and for this object would produce arguments more or less forcible and correct. All the men of this party were fishing for rubles, decorations, and promotions, and in this pursuit watched only the weathercock of imperial favor. And directly they noticed it turning in any direction, this whole drone population of the army began blowing hard that way. So it was all the harder for the emperor to turn it elsewhere. Amidst the uncertainties of the position, with the menace of serious danger giving a peculiarly threatening character to everything, Amid this vortex of intrigue, egotism, conflict of views and feelings, and the diversity of race among these people, this eighth and largest party of those preoccupied with personal interests imparted great confusion and obscurity to the common task. Whatever question arose, a swarm of these drones, without having finished their buzzing on a previous theme, flew over to the new one, and by their hum drowned and obscured the voices of those who were disputing honestly. From among all these parties, just at the time Prince Andrew reached the army, another, a ninth party, was being formed and was beginning to raise its voice. This was the party of the elders, reasonable men, experienced and capable in state affairs, who, without sharing any of those conflicting opinions, were able to take a detached view of what was going on at the staff at headquarters and to consider means of escape from this muddle, indecision, intricacy, and weakness. The men of this party said and thought that what was wrong resulted chiefly from the emperor's presence in the army with his military court and from the consequent presence there of an indefinite conditional and unsteady fluctuation of relations which is in place at court but harmful in an army that a sovereign should reign but not command the army and that the only way out of the position would be for the emperor and his court to leave the army that the mere presence of the emperor paralyzed the action of fifty thousand men required to secure his personal safety and that the worst commander-in-chief if independent, would be better than the very best one trammeled by the presence and authority of the monarch. Just at the time Prince Andrew was living unoccupied at Drisa, Shishkov, the Secretary of State, and one of the chief representatives of this party, wrote a letter to the Emperor which Arakcheyev and Balashov agreed to sign. In this letter, availing himself of permission given him by the emperor to discuss the general course of affairs, he respectfully suggested, on the plea that it was necessary for the sovereign to arouse a warlike spirit in the people of the capital, that the emperor should leave the army. That arousing of the people by their sovereign, and his call to them to defend their country, the very incitement which was the chief cause of Russia's triumph, insofar as it was produced by the Tsar's personal presence in Moscow, was suggested to the Emperor and accepted by him as a pretext for quitting the army. End of chapter 9by Ernst Patinama. Chapter 10 This letter had not yet been presented to the Emperor when Barclay, one day at dinner, informed Bolkonsky that the Sovereign wished to see him personally, to question him about Turkey, and that Prince Andrew was to present himself at Bennigsen's quarters at six that evening. News was received at the Emperor's quarters that very day of a fresh movement by Napoleon which might endanger the army, news subsequently found to be false. And that morning, Colonel Michaud had ridden round the Drissa fortifications with the Emperor, and had pointed out to him that this fortified camp, constructed by Pfuel, until then considered a chef d'oeuvre of tactical science, which would ensure Napoleon's destruction, was an absurdity threatening the destruction of the Russian army. Prince Andrew arrived at Benningsen's quarters, a 
country gentleman's house of moderate size situated on the very banks of the river neither benningson nor the emperor was there but chernyshov the emperor's aide-de-camp received bolkonsky and informed him that the emperor accompanied by general benningson and marquis paulucci had gone a second time that day to inspect the fortifications of the drissa camp of the suitability of which serious doubts were beginning to be felt chernyshov was sitting at a window in the first room with a french novel in his hand this room had probably been a music room there was still an organ in it on which some rugs were piled and in one corner stood the folding bedstead of benningson's adjutant this adjutant was also there and sat dozing on the rolled-up bedding evidently exhausted by work or by feasting two doors led from the room one straight on into what had been the drawing-room and another on the right to the study through the first door came the sound of voices conversing in german and occasionally in french in that drawing-room were gathered by the emperor's wish not a military council the emperor preferred indefiniteness but certain persons whose opinions he wished to know in view of the impending difficulties it was not a council of war but as it were a council to elucidate certain questions for the emperor personally to this semi-council had been invited the swedish general armfeld adjutant general wolzogen Vincignerode, whom napoleon had referred to as a renegade french subject michaud Toll, count stein who was not a military man at all and Pfuel himself who as prince andrew had heard was the mainspring of the whole affair prince andrew had an opportunity of getting a good look at him for Pfuel arrived soon after himself and in passing through to the drawing-room stopped a minute to speak to chernyshov at first sight Pfuel, in his ill-made uniform of a russian general which fitted him badly like a fancy costume seemed familiar to prince andrew though he saw him now for the first time there was about him something of weihauter mack and schmidt and many other german theorists generals whom prince andrew had seen in eighteen hundred and five but he was more typical than any of them prince andrew had never yet seen a german theorist in whom all the characteristics of those others were united to such an extent Pfuel was short and very thin but broad-boat of coarse robust build broad in the hips and with prominent shoulder blades his face was much wrinkled and his eyes deep-set his hair had evidently been hastily brushed smooth in front of the temples but stuck up behind in quaint little tufts he entered the room looking restlessly and angrily around as if afraid of everything in that large apartment awkwardly holding up his sword he addressed chernyshov and asked in german where the emperor was one could see that he wished to pass through the rooms as quickly as possible finish with the bows and greetings and sit down to business in front of a map where he would feel at home he nodded hurriedly in reply to chernyshov and smiled ironically on hearing that the sovereign was inspecting the fortifications that he fuel had planned in accord with his theory he muttered something to himself abruptly and in a bass voice as self-assured germans do it might have been stupid fellow or the whole affair will be ruined or something absurd will come of it prince andrew did not catch what he said and would have passed on but chernyshov introduced him to Pfuel, remarking that prince andrew was just back from turkey where the war had terminated so fortunately Pfuel barely glanced not so much at prince andrew as passed him and said with a laugh that must have been a fine tactical war and laughing contemptuously went on into the room from which the sound of voices was heard Pfuel, always inclined to be irritably sarcastic was particularly disturbed that day evidently by the fact that he had dared to inspect and criticize his camp in his absence 
From this short interview with Pfuel, Prince Andrew, thanks to his Austerlitz experiences, was able to form a clear conception of the man. Pfuel was one of those hopelessly and immutably self-confident men, self-confident to the point of martyrdom, as only Germans are, because only Germans are self-confident on the basis of an abstract notion, science, that is, the supposed knowledge of absolute truth. A Frenchman is self-assured because he regards himself personally, both in mind and body, as irresistibly attractive to men and women. An Englishman is self-assured as being a citizen of the best organized state in the world, and therefore, as an Englishman always knows what he should do, and knows that all he does as an Englishman is undoubtedly correct. An Italian is self-assured because he is excitable and easily forgets himself and other people. A Russian is self-assured just because he knows nothing, does not want to know anything, since he does not believe that anything can be known. The German's self-assurance is worst of all, stronger and more repulsive than any other, because he imagines that he knows the truth, science, which he himself has invented, but which is for him the absolute truth. Fuel was evidently of that sort. He had a science, the theory of oblique movements deduced by him from the history of Frederick the Great's wars, and all he came across in the history of more recent warfare seemed to him absurd and barbarous, monstrous collisions in which so many blunders were committed by both sides that these wars could not be called wars. They did not accord with the theory, and therefore could not serve as material for science. In 1806, Fuel had been one of those responsible for the plan of campaign that ended in Jena and Auerstadt, but he did not see the least proof of the fallibility of his theory in the disasters of that war. On the contrary, the deviations made from his theory were, in his opinion, the sole cause of the whole disaster, and with characteristically gleeful sarcasm he would remark, There! I said the whole affair would go to the devil. Fuel was one of those theoreticians who so love their theory that they lose sight of the theory's object, its practical application. His love of theory made him hate everything practical, and he would not listen to it. He was even pleased by failures, for failures resulting from deviations in practice from the theory only proved to him the accuracy of his theory. He said a few words to Prince Andrew and Chernyshov about the present war, with the air of a man who knows beforehand that all will go wrong, and who is not displeased that it should be so. The unbrushed tufts of hair sticking up behind, and the hastily brushed hair on his temples, express this most eloquently. He passed into the next room, and the deep, querulous sounds of his voice were at once heard from there. End of chapter 10 Recording by Ernst Patinama, Amsterdam, the Netherlands Book 9, Chapter 11 Read for LibriVox.org by Shilifa Malichem Prince Andrew's eyes were still following Pfuel out of the room, when Count Bennigsen entered hurriedly, and, nodding to Bolgonsky, but not pausing, went into the study, giving instructions to his adjutant as he went. The Emperor was following him, and Bennigsen had hastened on to make some preparations, and to be ready to receive the sovereign. Chernyshov and Prince Andrew went out into the porch, where the Emperor, who looked fatigued, was dismounting. Marcus Palucci was talking to him with particular warmth, and the Emperor, with his head bent to the left, was listening with a dissatisfied air. The Emperor moved forward, evidently wishing to end the conversation, but the flushed and excited Italian, oblivious of decorum, followed him and continued to speak. "'And as for the man who advised forming this camp, the dresser camp, said Paolucci, as the Emperor mounted the steps, and noticing Prince Andrew, scanned his unfamiliar face. 
"'As to that person, sire,' continued Paluchi, desperately, apparently unable to restrain himself, "'the man who advised the dresser camp, I see no alternative but the lunatic asylum or the gallows.' Without heeding the end of the Italian's remarks, and, as though not hearing them, the emperor, recognizing Bolgonsky, addressed him graciously. "'I am very glad to see you. Go in there, where they are meeting, and wait for me.' The emperor went into the study. He was followed by Prince Peter Mikhailovich Volkonsky and Baron Stein, and the door closed behind them. Prince Andrew, taking advantage of the Emperor's permission, accompanied Paolucci, whom he had known in Turkey, into the drawing-room where the council was assembled. Prince Peter Mykolovich Volkonsky occupied the position, as it were, of chief of the Emperor's staff. He came out of the study into the drawing-room with some maps which he spread on the table, and put questions on which he wished to hear the opinion of the gentlemen present. What had happened was that news, which afterwards proved to be false, had been received during the night of a movement by the French to outflank the Dresser camp. The first to speak was General Armfield, who, to meet the difficulty that presented itself, unexpectedly proposed a perfectly new position away from the Petersburg and Moscow roads. The reason for this was inexplicable, unless he wished to show that he, too, could have an opinion. But he urged— that at this point the army should unite and there await the enemy. It was plain that Armfeld had thought out that plan long ago, and now expounded it not so much to answer the questions put, which, in fact, his plan did not answer, as to avail himself of the opportunity to air it. It was one of the millions of proposal, one as good as another, that could be made as long as it was quite unknown what character the war would take. Some disputed his arguments, others defended them. Young Count Toll objected to the Swedish general's views more warmly than anyone else, and in the course of the dispute drew from his side pocket a well-filled notebook, which he asked permission to read to them. In these voluminous notes Toll suggested another scheme, totally different from Armfeld's obfuse plan of campaign. In answer to Toll, Paolici suggested an advance and an attack, which, he urged, could alone extricate us from the present uncertainty and from the trap, as he called the Dresser camp, in which we were situated. During all these discussions, Fuel and his interpreter, Volzogen, his rich in court relations, were silent. Fuel only snorted contemptuously and turned away, to show that he would never demean himself by replying to such nonsense as he was now hearing. So, when Prince Volkonsky, who was in the chair, called on him to give his opinion, he merely said, "'Why ask me? General Armfels has proposed a splendid position with an exposed rear. Or why not this Italian gentleman's attack? Very fine. Or a retreat. Also good.' "'Why ask me?' said he. "'Why, you yourself know everything better than I do.' But when Volkonsky said, with a frown, that it was in the Emperor's name that he asked his opinion— Fuel rose, and, suddenly growing animated, began to speak. "'Everything has been spoiled, everything muddled, everybody thought they knew better than I did, and now you come to me. How mend matters? There is nothing to mend. The principles laid down by me must be strictly adhered to,' said he, drumming on the table with his bony fingers. "'What is a difficulty? A nonsense! Childishness!' He went up to the map, and, speaking rapidly, began proving that no eventuality could alter the efficiency of the dresser camp, that everything had been foreseen, and that if the enemy were really going to outflank it, the enemy would inevitably be destroyed. Paolucci, who did not know German, began questioning him in French. Volzogen came to the assistance of his chief, who spoke French badly, and began translating for him, hardly able to keep pace with Fuel, who was rapidly demonstrating that not only all that had happened, but all that could happen, had been foreseen in a scheme, and that if there were now any difficulties, the whole fault lay in the fact that his plan had not been precisely executed. He kept laughing sarcastically, he demonstrated, and at last contemptuously ceased to demonstrate, like a mathematician who ceases to prove in various ways the accuracy of a problem that has already been proved. 
Volzogen took his place and continued to explain his views in French, every now and then turning to Pfuel and saying, "'Is it not so, Your Excellency?' But Pfuel, like a man heated in a fight who strikes those on his own side, shouted angrily at his own supporter, Volzogen, "'Well, of course! What more is there to explain?' Paolucci and Michaud both attacked Volzogen simultaneously in French. Armfeld addressed Pfuel in German. Toll explained to Volkonsky in Russian. Prince Andrew listened and observed in silence. Of all these men, Prince Andrew sympathized most with Pfuel, angry, determined, and absurdly self-confident as he was. Of all those present, evidently he alone was not seeking anything for himself— nursed no hatred against any one, and only desired that a plan, formed on a theory arrived at by years of toil, should be carried out. He was ridiculous and unpleasantly sarcastic, but yet he inspired involuntary respect by his boundless devotion to an idea. Besides this, three marks of all except few had one common trait that had not been noticeable at the Council of War in 1805. There was now a panic fear of Napoleon's genius, which, though concealed, was noticeable in every rejoinder. Everything was assumed to be possible for Napoleon. They expected him from every side, and invoked his terrible name to shatter each other's proposals. Fuel alone seemed to consider Napoleon a barbarian, like everyone else who opposes a theory. But besides this feeling of respect, Fuel evoked pity— in Prince Andrew, from the tone in which the courtiers addressed him, and the way Paolucci had allowed himself to speak of him to the Emperor, but above all from a certain desperation of Fuel's own expressions. It was clear that the others knew, and Fuel himself felt, that his fall was at hand, and despite his self-confidence and grumpy German sarcasm, he was pitiable, with his hair smoothly brushed on the temples and sticking up in tufts behind. So he concealed the factor in a show of irritation and contempt. He was evidently in despair that the sole remaining chance of verifying his theory by a huge experiment, and proving its soundness to the whole world, was slipping away from him. The discussions continued a long time, and the longer they lasted, the more heated became the dispute, culminating in shouts and personalities, and the less was it possible to arrive at any general conclusion from all that had been said. Prince Andrew, listening to this polyglot talk, and to the surmises, plans, refutations, and shouts, felt nothing but amazement at what they were saying. A thought, such as long since and often occurred to him during his military activities, the idea that there is not and cannot be any science of war, and that therefore there can be no such a thing as a military genius, now appeared to him an obvious truth. What theory and science is possible about a matter, the conditions and circumstances of which are unknown and cannot be defined, especially when the strength of the acting forces cannot be ascertained? No one was or is able to foresee in what condition our or the enemy's armies will be in a day's time, and no one can gauge the force of this or that detachment. Sometimes, when there is not a coward at the front to shout, we are cut off and start running, but a brave and jolly lad who shouts, Hurrah! A detachment of five thousand is worth thirty thousand, as at Schongraben, while at times fifty thousand run from eight thousand, as at Osterlitz. What science can there be in a matter in which, as in all practical matters, nothing can be defined and everything depends on innumerable conditions, the significance of which is determined at a particular moment which arrives no one knows when. Armfel says our army is cut in half, and Paolucci says we have got the French army between two fires. Michaud says that the worthlessness of the dresser camp lies in having the river behind it, and Phil says that is what constitutes its strength. Toll proposes one plan, Armfeld another, and they are all good and all bad, and the advantages of any suggestions can be seen only at the moment of trial. And why do they all speak of a military genius? Is a man a genius who can order bread to be brought up at the right time, and say who is to go to the right and who to the left? It is only because military men are invested with pomp and power, 
and crowds of sycophants flatter power, attributing to it qualities of genius it does not possess. The best generals I have known were, on the contrary, stupid or absent-minded men. Bagration was the best, Napoleon himself admitted that, and of Bonaparte himself. I remember his limited, self-satisfied face on the field of Austerlitz. Not only does a good army commander not need any special qualities, on the contrary, he needs the absence of the highest and best human attributes, love, poetry, tenderness, and philosophic inquiring doubt. He should be limited, firmly convinced that what he is doing is very important, otherwise he will not have sufficient patience, and only then will he be a brave leader. God forbid that he should be human, should love or pity, or think of what is just and unjust. It is understandable that the theory of their genius was invented for them long ago, because they have power. The success of a military action depends not on them, but on the man in the ranks who shouts, We are lost, or who shouts, Hurrah! And only in the ranks can one serve with assurance of being useful. So thought Prince Andrew, as he listened to the talking, and he roused himself only when Paolucci called him, and every one was leaving. At a review next day, the Emperor asked Prince Andrew where he would like to serve, and Prince Andrew lost his standing in court circles forever, by not asking to remain attached to the sovereign's person, but for permission to serve in the army. End of chapter 11 this recording is in the public domain. Book Nine, Chapter Twelve, read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman. Before the beginning of the campaign, Rostov had received a letter from his parents, in which they told him briefly of Natasha's illness and the breaking off of her engagement to Prince Andrew which they explained by Natasha's having rejected him, and again asked Nicholas to retire from the army and return home. On receiving this letter, Nicholas did not even make any attempt to get leave of absence or to retire from the army, but wrote to his parents that he was sorry Natasha was ill and her engagement broken off, and that he would do all he could to meet their wishes. To Sonia he wrote separately, Adored friend of my soul, he wrote, Nothing but honour could keep me from returning to the country, but now, at the commencement of the campaign, I should feel dishonoured not only in my comrades' eyes, but in my own, if I preferred my own happiness to my love and duty to the fatherland. But this shall be our last separation. Believe me, directly the war is over, if I am still alive and still loved by you, I will throw up everything and fly to you, to press you for ever to my ardent breast. It was, in fact, only the commencement of the campaign that prevented Rostov from returning home as he had promised, and marrying Sonia. The autumn in Otradno with the hunting, and the winter with the Christmas holidays and Sonia's love, had opened out to him a vista of tranquil rural joys and peace, such as he had never known before, and which now allured him. A splendid wife, children, a good pack of hounds, a dozen leashes of smart borzois, agriculture, neighbours, service by election, thought he. But now the campaign was beginning, and he had to remain with his regiment. And since it had to be so, Nicholas Rostov, as was natural to him, felt contented with the life he led in the regiment, and was able to find pleasure in that life. On his return from his furlough, Nicholas, having been joyfully welcomed by his comrades, was sent to obtain remounts, and brought back from the Ukraine excellent horses, which pleased him and earned him commendation from his commanders. During his absence he had been promoted captain, and when the regiment was put on war footing with an increase in numbers, he was again allotted his old squadron. The campaign began. The regiment was moved into Poland on double pay, new officers arrived, new men and horses, and above all, everybody was infected with a merrily excited mood that goes with the commencement of a war. And Rostov, 
conscious of his advantageous position in the regiment, devoted himself entirely to the pleasures and interests of military service, though he knew that sooner or later he would have to relinquish them. The troops retired from Vilna for various complicated reasons of state, political and strategic. Each step of the retreat was accompanied by a complicated interplay of interests, arguments and passions at headquarters. For the Pavlograd Hussars, however, the whole of this retreat during the finest period of summer and with sufficient supplies was a very simple and agreeable business. It was only at headquarters that there was depression, uneasiness, and intriguing. In the body of the army, they did not ask themselves where they were going or why. If they regretted having to retreat, it was only because they had to leave billets they had grown accustomed to, or some pretty young Polish lady. If the thought that things looked bad chanced to enter anyone's head, he tried to be cheerful, as befits a good soldier, and not to think of the general trend of affairs, but only of the task nearest to hand. First they camped gaily before Vilna, making acquaintance with the Polish landowners, preparing for reviews, and being reviewed by the emperor and other high commanders. Then came an order to retreat to Svensiani, and destroy any provisions they could not carry away with them. Svensiani was remembered by the hussars only as the Drunken Camp, a name the whole army gave to their encampment there, and because many complaints were made against the troops, who, taking advantage of the order to collect provisions, took also horses, carriages, and carpets from the Polish proprietors. Rostov remembered Svensiani because on the first day of their arrival at that small town he changed his sergeant-major, and was unable to manage all the drunken men of the squadron who, unknown to him, had appropriated five barrels of old beer. From Svensiani they retired further and further to Drissa, and thence again beyond Drissa, drawing near to the frontier of Russia proper. On the 13th of July, the Pavlograds took part in a serious action for the first time. On the 12th of July, on the eve of that action, there was a heavy storm of rain and hail. In general, the summer of 1812 was remarkable for its storms. The two Pavlograd squadrons were bivouacking on a field of rye, which was already in ear but had been completely trodden down by cattle and horses. The rain was descending in torrents, and Rostov, with a young officer named Ilyin, his protégé, was sitting in a hastily constructed shelter. An officer of their regiment, with long moustaches extending on his cheeks, who after riding to the staff had been overtaken by the rain, entered Rostov's shelter. I have come from the staff, Count. Have you heard of Ryevsky's exploit? And the officer gave them details of the Sultanov battle, which he had heard at the staff. Rostov, smoking his pipe and turning his head about as the water trickled down his neck, listened inattentively, with an occasional glance at Ilyin, who was pressing close to him. This officer, a lad of sixteen who had recently joined the regiment, was now in the same relation to Nicholas that Nicholas had been to Denisov seven years before. Ilyin tried to imitate Rostov in everything, and adored him as a girl might have done. Strijinsky, the officer with the long moustache, spoke grandiloquently of the Sultanov Dam being a Russian Thermopylae, and of how a deed worthy of antiquity had been performed by General Rayevsky. He recounted how Rayevsky had led his two sons onto the dam under terrific fire, and had charged with them beside him. Rostov heard the story, and not only said nothing to encourage Strijinsky's enthusiasm, but on the contrary looked like a man ashamed of what he was hearing, though with no intention of contradicting it. Since the campaigns of Austerlitz and of 1807, Rostov knew by experience that men always lie when describing military exploits, as he himself had done when recounting them. Besides that, he had experience enough to know that nothing happens in war at all as we can imagine or relate it and so he did not like Strijinsky's tale, nor did he like Strijinsky himself, who, with his moustaches extending over his cheeks, bent low over the face of his hearer, as was his habit, and crowded Rostov in the narrow shanty. 
Rostov looked at him in silence. In the first place, there must have been such a confusion and crowding on the dam that was being attacked, that if Raevsky did lead his sons there, it could have had no effect except perhaps on some dozen men nearest to him, thought he. The rest could not have seen how or with whom Raevsky came on to the dam, and even those who did see it would not have been much stimulated by it. For what had they to do with Ryevsky's tender paternal feelings when their own skins were in danger? And besides, the fate of the fatherland did not depend on whether they took the Sultanov dam or not, as we are told was the case at Thermopylae. So why should he have made such a sacrifice? And why expose his own children in the battle? I would not have taken my brother Petya there, or even Ilyin, who's a stranger to me, but a nice lad but would have tried to put them somewhere under cover, Nicholas continued to think, as he listened to Stradzinski. But he did not express his thoughts, for in such matters, too, he had gained experience. He knew that this tale redounded to the glory of our arms, and so one had to pretend not to doubt it, and he acted accordingly. "'I can't stand this any more,' said Ilyin, noticing that Rostov did not relish Stradzinski's conversation. "'My stockings and shirt, and the water is running on my seat. "'I'll go and look for shelter. The rain seems less heavy.' "'Ilyin went out, and Stradzinski rode away. Five minutes later, Ilyin, splashing through the mud, "'came running back to the shanty. "'Hurrah! Rostov, come quick! I found it! "'About two hundred yards away, there's a tavern where ours have already gathered. "'We can at least get dry there, and Mary Hendrikovna's there.' Mary Hendrikovna was the wife of the regimental doctor, a pretty young German woman he had married in Poland. The doctor, whether from lack of means or because he did not like to part from his young wife in the early days of their marriage, took her about with him wherever the Hussar regiment went, and his jealousy had become a standing joke among the Hussar officers. Rostov threw his cloak over his shoulders, shouted to Lavrushka to follow with the things, and now slipping in the mud, now splashing right through it, set off with Ilyin in the lessening rain, and the darkness that was occasionally rent by distant lightning. Rostov, where are you? Here! What lightning? they called to one another. End of chapter 12《In the tavern, before which stood the doctor's covered cart, there were already some five officers. Mary Hendrikovna, a plump little blonde German, in a dressing jacket and nightcap, was sitting on a broad bench in the front corner. Her husband, the doctor, lay asleep behind her. Rostov and Ilyin, on entering the room, were welcomed with merry shouts and laughter. "'Dear me, how jolly we are!' said Rostov, laughing. And why do you stand there gaping? What swells they are! Why are the water streams from them? Don't make our drawing-room so wet! Don't mess Mary Hendrikovna's dress! cried other voices. Rostov and Ilyin hastened to find a corner where they could change into dry clothes without offending Mary Hendrikovna's modesty. They were going into a tiny recess behind a partition to change, but found it completely filled by three officers, who sat playing cards by the light of a solitary candle on an empty box, and these officers would on no account yield their position. Mary Hendrikovna obliged them with the loan of a petticoat to be used as a curtain, and behind that screen Rostov and Ilyin, helped by Lavrushka, who had brought their kits, changed their wet things for dry ones. A fire was made up in the dilapidated brick stove, a board was found, fixed on two saddles and covered with a horse-cloth, a small samovar was produced, and a celeret and half a bottle of rum, and having asked Mary Hendrikovna to preside, they all crowded round her. One offered her a clean handkerchief to wipe her charming hands, another spread a jacket under her little feet to keep them from the damp, another hung his coat over the window to keep out the draught, and yet another waved the flies off her husband's face, lest he should wake up. "'Leave him alone,' said Mary Hendrikovna, smiling timidly and happily. "'He is sleeping well as it is, after a sleepless night.' "'Oh, no, Mary Hendrikovna,' replied the officer. "'One must look after the doctor. 
Perhaps he'll take pity on me some day, when it comes to cutting off a leg or an arm for me. There were only three tumblers. The water was so muddy that one could not make out whether the tea was strong or weak, and the samovar held only six tumblers of water. But this made it all the pleasanter to take turns in order of seniority to receive one's tumbler from Mary Hendrikovna's plump little hands with their short and not over clean nails. All the officers appeared to be and really were in love with her that evening. Even those playing cards behind the partition soon left their game and came over to the samovar, yielding to the general mood of courting Mary Hendrikovna. She, seeing herself surrounded by such brilliant and polite young men, beamed with satisfaction, try as she might to hide it, and perturbed as she evidently was each time her husband moved in his sleep behind her. There was only one spoon, Sugar was more plentiful than anything else, but it took too long to dissolve. So it was decided that Mary Hendrikovna should stir the sugar for everyone in turn. Rostov received his tumbler, and adding some rum to it, asked Mary Hendrikovna to stir it. But you take it without sugar, she said, smiling all the time, as if everything she said and everything the others said was very amusing and had a double meaning. It is not the sugar I want, but only that your little hand should stir my tea. Mary Hendrikovna assented, and began looking for the spoon, which someone meanwhile had pounced on. Use your finger, Mary Hendrikovna, it will be still nicer, said Rostov. Too hot, she replied, blushing with pleasure. Ilyin put a few drops of rum into the bucket of water, and brought it to Mary Hendrikovna, asking her to stir it with her finger. "'This is my cup,' said he. "'Only dip your finger in it, and I'll drink it all up.' When they had emptied the samovar, Rostov took a pack of cards and proposed that they should play kings with Mary Hendrikovna. They drew lots to settle who should make up her set. At Rostov's suggestion, it was agreed that whoever became king should have the right to kiss Mary Hendrikovna's hand, and that the booby should go to refill and reheat the samovar for the doctor when the latter awoke. "'Well, but supposing Mary Hendrikovna is king?' asked Ilyin. "'As it is, she is queen and her word is law.' They had hardly begun to play before the doctor's dishevelled head suddenly appeared from behind Mary Hendrikovna. He had been awake some time, listening to what was being said, and evidently found nothing entertaining or amusing in what was going on. His face was sad and depressed. Without greeting the officers, he scratched himself, and asked to be allowed to pass as they were blocking the way. As soon as he had left the room, all the officers burst into loud laughter, and Mary Hendrikovna blushed, till her eyes filled with tears, and thereby became still more attractive to them. Returning from the yard, the doctor told his wife, who had ceased to smile so happily, and looked at him in alarm, awaiting her sentence, that the rain had ceased, and they must go to sleep in their covered cart, or everything in it would be stolen. "'But I'll send an orderly! Two of them!' said Rostov. "'What an idea, doctor! I'll stand guard on it myself!' said Ilyin. "'No, gentlemen, you have had your sleep, but I have not slept for two nights,' replied the doctor and he sat down morosely beside his wife, waiting for the game to end. Seeing his gloomy face as he frowned at his wife, the officers grew still merrier, and some of them could not refrain from laughter, for which they hurriedly sought plausible pretexts. When he had gone, taking his wife with him, and had settled down with her in their covered cart, the officers lay down in the tavern, covering themselves with their wet cloaks, but they did not sleep for a long time. Now they exchanged remarks, recalling the doctor's uneasiness and his wife's delight. Now they ran out into the porch and reported what was taking place in the covered trap. Several times Rostov, covering his head, tried to go to sleep, but some remark would arouse him, and conversation would be resumed, to the accompaniment of unreasoning, merry, childlike laughter. End of chapter 13
Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman. It was nearly three o'clock, but no one was yet asleep, when the quartermaster appeared with an order to move on to the little town of Ostrovna. Still laughing and talking, the officers began hurriedly getting ready, and again boiled some muddy water in the samovar. But Rostov went off to his squadron, without waiting for tea. Day was breaking, the rain had ceased, and the clouds were dispersing. It felt damp and cold, especially in clothes that were still moist. As they left the tavern in the twilight of the dawn, Rostov and Ilyin both glanced under the wet and glistening leather hood of the doctor's cart, from under the apron of which his feet were sticking out, and in the middle of which his wife's nightcap was visible, and her sleepy breathing audible. "'She really is a dear little thing,' said Rostov to Ilyin, who was following him. "'A charming woman,' said Ilyin, with all the gravity of a boy of sixteen. Half an hour later, the squadron was lined up on the road. The command was heard to mount, and the soldiers crossed themselves and mounted. Rostov, riding in front, gave the order, "'Forward!' and the hussars, with clanking sabres and subdued talk, their horses' hooves splashing in the mud, defiled in fours, and moved along the broad road planted with birch trees on each side, following the infantry and a battery that had gone on in front. Tattered, blue-purple clouds, reddening in the east, were scudding before the wind. It was growing lighter and lighter. That curly grass which always grows by country roadsides became clearly visible, still wet with the night's rain. The drooping branches of the birches, also wet, swayed in the wind and flung down bright drops of water to one side. The soldiers' faces were more and more clearly visible. Rostov, always closely followed by Ilyin, rode along the side of the road between two rows of birch trees. When campaigning, Rostov allowed himself the indulgence of riding not a regimental, but a Cossack horse. A judge of horses and a sportsman, he had lately procured himself a large, fine, mettlesome Donetsk horse, dun-coloured with light mane and tail, and when he rode it no one could out-gallop him. To ride this horse was a pleasure to him, and he thought of the horse, of the morning, of the doctor's wife, but not once of the impending danger. Formerly, when going into action, Rostov had felt afraid. Now he had not the least feeling of fear. He was fearless, not because he had grown used to being under fire, one cannot grow used to danger, but because he had learned how to manage his thoughts when in danger. He had grown accustomed, when going into action, to think about anything but what would seem most likely to interest him the impending danger. During the first period of his service, hard as he tried and much as he reproached himself with cowardice, he had not been able to do this, but with time it had come of itself. Now he rode beside Ilyin under the birch trees, occasionally plucking leaves from a branch that met his hand, sometimes touching his horse's side with his foot, or without turning round, handing a pipe he had finished to an hussar riding behind him, with as calm and careless an air as though he were merely out for a ride. He glanced with pity at the excited face of Ilyin, who talked much and in great agitation. He knew from experience the tormenting expectation of terror and death the cornet was suffering, and knew that only time could help him. As soon as the sun appeared in a clear strip of sky beneath the clouds, the wind fell, as if it dared not spoil the beauty of the summer morning after the storm. Drops still continued to fall, but vertically now, and all was still. The whole sun appeared on the horizon and disappeared behind a long, narrow cloud that hung above it. A few minutes later it reappeared brighter still from behind the top of the cloud, tearing its edge. Everything grew bright and glittered, and with that light, and as if in reply to it, came the sound of guns ahead of them. Before Rostov had had time to consider and determine the distance of that firing, Count Osterman Tolstoy's adjutant came galloping from Vitebsk with orders to advance at a trot along the road. 
the squadron overtook and passed the infantry and the battery, which had also quickened their pace, rode down a hill, and passing through an empty and deserted village again ascended. The horses began to lather, and the men to flush. Halt! Dress your ranks! The order of the regimental commander was heard ahead. Forward by the left! Walk! March! came the order from in front and the hussars, passing along the line of troops on the left flank of our position, halted behind our uhlans, who were in the front line. To the right stood our infantry in a dense column. They were the reserve. Higher up the hill, on the very horizon, our guns were visible through the wonderfully clear air, brightly illuminated by slanting morning sunbeams. In front, beyond a hollow dale, could be seen the enemy's columns and guns. Our advanced line, already in action, could be heard briskly exchanging shots with the enemy in the dale. At these sounds, long unheard, Rostov's spirits rose as at the strains of the merriest music. Trap, tat, tat, tap, cracked the shots, now together, now several quickly, one after another. Again all was silent, and then again it sounded as if someone were walking on detonators and exploding them. The hussars remained in the same place for about an hour. A cannonade began. Count Osterman, with his suite, rode up behind the squadron, halted, spoke to the commander of the regiment, and rode up the hill to the guns. After Osterman had gone, a command rang out to the Uhlans. Form column! Prepare to charge! The infantry in front of them parted into platoons to allow the cavalry to pass. The Uhlans started, the streamers on their spears fluttering, and trotted downhill towards the French cavalry, which was seen below to the left. As soon as the Uhlans descended the hill, the hussars were ordered up the hill to support the battery. As they took the places vacated by the Uhlans, bullets came from the front, whining and whistling, but fell spent without taking effect. These sounds, which he had not heard for so long, had an even more pleasurable and exhilarating effect on Rostov than the previous sounds of firing. Drawing himself up, he viewed the field of battle opening out before him from the hill, and with his whole soul followed the movement of the Uhlans. They swooped down close to the French dragoons. Something confused happened there amid the smoke, and five minutes later our Uhlans were galloping back, not to the place they had occupied, but more to the left, and among the orange-coloured Uhlans on chestnut horses and behind them in a large group, blue French dragoons on grey horses could be seen. End of chapter 14「Book Nine, Chapter Fifteen, read for by Andrew Coleman. Rostov, with his keen sportsman's eye, was one of the first to catch sight of these blue French dragoons pursuing our Uhlans. Nearer and nearer in disorderly crowds came the Uhlans and the French dragoons pursuing them. He could already see how these men, who looked so small at the foot of the hill, jostled and overtook one another, waving their arms and their sabres in the air. Rostov gazed at what was happening before him, as at a hunt. He felt instinctively that if the hussars struck at the French dragoons now, the latter could not withstand them. But if a charge was to be made, it must be done now, that very moment, or it would be too late. He looked round. A captain, standing beside him, was gazing like himself, with eyes fixed on the cavalry below them. Andrew Sevastyanitch, said Rostov, you know we could crush them. A fine thing too, replied the captain, and really, Rostov, without waiting to hear him out, touched his horse, galloped to the front of the squadron, and before he had time to finish giving the word of command, the whole squadron, sharing his feeling, was following him. Rostov himself did not know how or why he did it. He acted as he did when hunting, without reflecting or considering. He saw the dragoons near, and that they were galloping in disorder. He knew they could not withstand an attack, knew there was only that moment, and that if he let it slip, it would not return. The bullets were whining and whistling so stimulatingly around him, and his horse was so eager to go that he could not restrain himself. He touched his horse, gave the word of command, and immediately, hearing behind him the tramp of the horses of his deployed squadron, rode at full trot downhill towards the dragoons. Hardly had they reached the bottom of the hill before their pace instinctively changed to a gallop, 
which grew faster and faster as they drew nearer to our Rolands and the French dragoons who galloped after them. The dragoons were now close at hand. On seeing our hussars, the foremost began to turn, while those behind began to halt. With the same feeling with which he had galloped across the path of a wolf, Rostov gave rein to his donet's horse and galloped to intersect the path of the dragoons' disordered lines. One Ulan stopped, another who was on foot flung himself to the ground to avoid being knocked over, and a riderless horse fell in among the hussars. Nearly all the French dragoons were galloping back. Rostov, picking out one on a grey horse, dashed after him. On the way he came upon a bush, his gallant horse cleared it, and almost before he had righted himself in his saddle, he saw that he would immediately overtake the enemy he had selected. That Frenchman, by his uniform an officer, was going at a gallop, crouching on his grey horse, and urging it on with his sabre. In another moment Rostov's horse dashed its breast against the hindquarters of the officer's horse, almost knocking it over and at the same instant Rostov, without knowing why, raised his sabre and struck the Frenchman with it. The instant he had done this, all Rostov's animation vanished. The officer fell, not so much from the blow, which had but slightly cut his arm above the elbow, as from the shock to his horse, and from fright. Rostov reined in his horse, and his eyes sought his foe to see whom he had vanquished. The French dragoon officer was hopping with one foot on the ground, the other being caught in the stirrup. His eyes, screwed up with fear, as if he every moment expected another blow, gazed up at Rostov with shrinking terror. His pale and mud-stained face, fair and young, with a dimple in the chin, and light blue eyes, was not an enemy's face at all suited to a battlefield, but a most ordinary, home-like face. Before Rostov had decided what to do with him, the officer cried, I surrender! He hurriedly, but vainly tried to get his foot out of the stirrup, and did not remove his frightened blue eyes from Rostov's face. Some hussars who galloped up disengaged his foot and helped him into the saddle. On all sides the hussars were busy with the dragoons. One was wounded, but though his face was bleeding, he would not give up his horse. Another was perched up behind an hussar, with his arms round him. A third was being helped by an hussar to mount his horse. In front the French infantry were firing as they ran. The hussars galloped hastily back with their prisoners. Rostov galloped back with the rest, aware of an unpleasant feeling of depression in his heart, something vague and confused, which he could not at all account for, had come over him with the capture of that officer, and the blow he had dealt him. Count Osterman Tolstoy met the returning hussars, sent for Rostov, thanked him, and said he would report his gallant deed to the Emperor, and would recommend him for a St. George's Cross. When sent for by Count Ostermann, Rostov, remembering that he had charged without orders, felt sure his commander was sending for him to punish him for breach of discipline. Ostermann's flattering words and promise of a reward should therefore have struck him all the more pleasantly. But he still felt that same vaguely disagreeable feeling of moral nausea. But what on earth is worrying me? he asked himself as he rode back from the general. Ilyin? No, he's safe. Have I disgraced myself in any way? No, that's not it. Something else, resembling remorse, tormented him. Yes, oh yes, that French officer with the dimple. And I remember how my arm paused when I raised it. Rostov saw the prisoners being led away, and galloped after them to have a look at his Frenchman with the dimple on his chin. He was sitting in his foreign uniform, on an hussar pack-horse, and looked anxiously about him. The sword cut on his arm could scarcely be called a wound. He glanced at Rostov with a feigned smile, and waved his hand in greeting. Rostov still had the same 
indefinite feeling, as of shame. All that day, and the next, his friends and comrades noticed that Rostov, without being dull or angry, was silent, thoughtful, and preoccupied. He drank reluctantly, tried to remain alone, and kept turning something over in his mind. Rostov was always thinking about that brilliant exploit of his, which to his amazement had gained him the St. George's Cross, and even given him a reputation for bravery. And there was something he could not at all understand. So others are even more afraid than I am, he thought. So that's all there is in what is called heroism. And did I do it for my country's sake? And how was he to blame, with his dimple and blue eyes? And how frightened he was. He thought I should kill him. Why should I kill him? My hand trembled. And they have given me a St. George's cross. I can't make it out at all. But while Nicholas was considering these questions, and still could reach no clear solution of what puzzled him so, the wheel of fortune in the service, as often happens, turned in his favour. After the affair at Dostrovna, he was brought into notice, received command of an hussar battalion, and when a brave officer was needed, he was chosen. End of chapter 15《》Chapter 16 Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Coleman On receiving news of Natasha's illness, the Countess, though not quite well yet and still weak, went to Moscow with Petya and the rest of the household, and the whole family moved from Maria Dmitrievna's house to their own and settled down in town. Natasha's illness was so serious that, fortunately for her and for her parents, the consideration of all that had caused the illness, her conduct, and the breaking off of her engagement, receded into the background. She was so ill that it was impossible for them to consider in how far she was to blame for what had happened. She could not eat or sleep, grew visibly thinner, coughed, and as the doctors made them feel, was in danger. They could not think of anything but how to help her, Doctors came to see her singly and in consultation, talked much in French, German, and Latin, blamed one another, and prescribed a great variety of medicines for all the diseases known to them. But the simple idea never occurred to any of them that they could not know the disease Natasha was suffering from, as no disease suffered by a live man can be known for every living person has his own peculiarities, and always has his own peculiar, personal, novel, complicated disease, unknown to medicine. Not a disease of the lungs, liver, skin, heart, nerves, and so on mentioned in medical books, but a disease consisting of one of the innumerable combinations of the maladies of those organs. This simple thought could not occur to the doctors, as it cannot occur to a wizard that he is unable to work charms, because the business of their lives was to cure, and they received money for it, and had spent the best years of their lives on that business. But above all, that thought was kept out of their minds, by the fact that they saw they were really useful, as in fact they were to the whole Rostov family. Their usefulness did not depend on making the patient swallow substances, for the most part harmful, the harm was scarcely perceptible, as they were given in small doses, but they were useful, necessary, and indispensable, because they satisfied a mental need of the invalid, and of those who loved her. And that is why there are, and always will be, pseudo-healers, 
wise women, homeopaths and allopaths. They satisfied that eternal human need for hope of relief, for sympathy, and that something should be done, which is felt by those who are suffering. They satisfied the need seen in its most elementary form in a child, when it wants to have a place rubbed that has been hurt. A child knocks itself and runs at once to the arms of its mother or nurse to have the aching spot rubbed or kissed, and it feels better when this is done. The child cannot believe that the strongest and wisest of its people have no remedy for its pain and the hope of relief, and the expression of its mother's sympathy while she rubs the bump, comforts it. The doctors were of use to Natasha, because they kissed and rubbed her bump, assuring her that it would soon pass if only the coachman went to the chemist's in the Arbat, and got a powder and some pills in a pretty box for a rouble and seventy kopecks, and if she took those powders in boiled water at intervals of precisely two hours, neither more nor less. What would Sonia and the Count and Countess have done? How would they have looked if nothing had been done? If there had not been those pills to give by the clock, the warm drinks, the chicken cutlets, and all the other details of life, ordered by the doctors, the carrying out of which supplied an occupation and consolation to the family circle. How would the Count have borne his dearly loved daughter's illness, had he not known that it was costing him a thousand roubles, and that he would not grudge thousands more to benefit her? Or had he not known that if her illness continued, he would not grudge yet other thousands, and would take her abroad for consultations there? And had he not been able to explain the details of how Metivier and Fella had not understood the symptoms, but Fries had, and Mudrov had diagnosed them even better? What would the Countess have done, had she not been able sometimes to scold the invalid for not strictly obeying the doctor's orders? You'll never get well like that, she would say, forgetting her grief in her vexation. If you won't obey the doctor and take your medicine at the right time, you mustn't trifle with it, you know, or it may turn to pneumonia, she would go on, deriving much comfort from the utterance of that foreign word, incomprehensible to others, as well as to herself. What would Sonia have done, without the glad consciousness that she had not undressed during the first three nights, in order to be ready to carry out all the doctor's injunctions with precision, and that she still kept awake at night so as not to miss the proper time when the slightly harmful pills in the little gilt box had to be administered. Even to Natasha herself, it was pleasant to see that so many sacrifices were being made for her sake and to know that she had to take medicine at certain hours, though she declared that no medicine would cure her, and that it was all nonsense. And it was even pleasant to be able to show, by disregarding the orders, that she did not believe in medical treatment and did not value her life. The doctor came every day, felt her pulse, looked at her tongue, and regardless of her grief-stricken face, joked with her. But when he had gone into another room, to which the countess hurriedly followed him, he assumed a grave air, and thoughtfully shaking his head, said that though there was danger, he had hopes of the effect of this last medicine, and one must wait and see, that the malady was chiefly mental, but... And the countess, trying to conceal the action from herself and from him, slipped a gold coin into his hand, and always returned to the patient with a more tranquil mind. The symptoms of Natasha's illness were that she ate little, slept little, coughed, and was always low-spirited. The doctors said that she could not get on without medical treatment, 
so they kept her in the stifling atmosphere of the town, and the Rostovs did not move to the country that summer of 1812. In spite of the many pills she swallowed, and the drops and powders out of the little bottles and boxes, of which Madame Schoss, who was fond of such things, made a large collection, and in spite of being deprived of the country life to which she was accustomed, youth prevailed. Natasha's grief began to be overlaid by the impressions of daily life. It ceased to press so painfully on her heart. It gradually faded into the past, and she began to recover physically. End of chapter 16